Hello everyone, this is Pastor Dan from Athens Christian Reformed Church and I am here uh, in partnership with the Athens Public Library to continue our readings of the Chronicles of Narnia. We are now on to book two, which is actually probably the most famous of C.S. Lewis's uh, Chronicles of Narnia books. It is The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, which many of you may have seen as a movie or have read otherwise, but hopefully you will enjoy this. We are going to start with chapter one, Lucy Looks Into a Wardrobe. Once there were four children, whose names were Peter, Susan, Edmund, and Lucy. This story is about something that happened to them when they were sent away from London during the war because of the air raids. That's London, England, and that's World War II, that is. They were sent to the house of an old professor who lived in the heart of the country, ten miles from the nearest railway station and two miles from the nearest post office, he had no wife, and he lived in a very large house with a housekeeper called Mrs. McCready and three servants. Their names were Ivory, Ivy, Margaret, and Betty, but they do not come into the story much. He himself was a very old man with shaggy white hair which grew over most of his face as well as on his head, and they liked him almost at once. But on the first evening, when he came out to meet them at the front door, he was so odd-looking that Lucy, who was the youngest, was a little afraid of him, and Edmund, who was the next youngest, wanted to laugh and had to keep on pretending he was blowing his nose to hide it. As soon as they had said good night to the professor and gone upstairs on the first night, the boys came into the girls' room and they all talked it over. We've fallen on our feet, and no mistake, said Peter. This is going to be perfectly splendid. That old chap will let us do anything we like. I think he's an old dear, said Susan. Oh, come off it, said Edmund, who was tired and pretending not to be tired, which always made him bad-tempered. Don't go on talking like that. Like what, said Susan. And anyway, it's time you were in bed. Trying to talk like mother, said Edmund. And who are you to say when I'm good to go to bed? Go to bed yourself. Hadn't we all better go to bed, said Lucy? There's sure to be a row if we're heard talking here. No, there won't, said Peter. I tell you, this is the sort of house where no one's going to mind what we do. Anyway, they won't hear us. It's about ten minutes' walk from here down to that dining room and any amount of stairs and passages in between. What's that noise? said Lucy suddenly. It was a far larger house than she had ever been in before, and the thought of all those long passages and rows of doors leading into empty rooms was beginning to make her feel a little creepy. It's only a bird, silly, said Edmund. It's an owl, said Peter. This is going to be a wonderful place for birds. I shall go to bed now. I, I say, let's go and explore tomorrow. You might find anything in a place like this. Did you see those mountains as we came along, and the woods? There might be eagles. There might be stags. There'll be hawks. Badgers, said Lucy. Foxes, said Edmund. Rabbits, said Susan. But when the next morning came, there was a steady rain falling, so thick that when you looked out of the window, you could see neither the mountains, nor the woods, nor even the stream in the garden. Of course it would be raining, said Edmund. They had just finished their breakfast with the professor and were upstairs in the room he had set apart for them, a long, low room with two windows looking out in one direction and two in another. Do stop grumbling, Ed, said Susan. Ten to one it'll clear up in an hour or so, and in the meantime we're pretty well off. There's a wireless and lots of books. Not for me, said Peter. I'm going to explore in the house. Everyone agreed to this, and that was how the adventures began. It was the sort of house that you'd never seem to come to the end of, and it was full of unexpected places. 
The first few doors they tried led only into square bedroom or spare bedrooms, excuse me, as everyone had expected that they would, but soon they came to a very long room full of pictures, and there they found a suit of armor, and after that was a room all hung with green, with a harp in one corner, and then came three steps down and five steps up, and then a kind of little hall, upstairs hall, and a door that led out onto a balcony and then a whole series of rooms that led into each other and were lined with books, most of them very old books and some bigger than a Bible in a church. And shortly after that, they looked into a room that was quite empty except for one big wardrobe, the sort that has a looking glass in the door. There was nothing else in the room at all except a dead blue bottle on the window sill. Nothing here, said Peter, and they all trooped out again all except Lucy. She stayed behind because she thought it would be worthwhile trying the door of the wardrobe, even though she felt almost sure that it would be locked. To her surprise, it opened quite easily, and two mothballs dropped out. Looking into the inside, she saw several coats hanging up, mostly long fur coats. There was nothing Lucy liked so much as the smell and feel of fur. She immediately stepped into the wardrobe and got in among the coats and rubbed her face against them, leaving the door open, of course, because she knew that it was that it is very foolish to shut oneself into any wardrobe. Soon she went further in and found there was a second row of coats hanging up behind the first one. It was almost quite dark in there, and she kept her arms stretched out in front of her so as to not bump her face into the back of the wardrobe. She took a step further in, then two or three steps, always expecting to feel woodwork against the tips of her fingers, but she could not feel it. This must be a simply enormous wardrobe, thought Lucy, going still further in and pushing the soft folds of the coats aside to make room for her. Then she noticed that there was something crunching under her feet. I wonder... Is that more mothballs, she thought, stooping down to feel it with her hand. But instead of feeling the hard, smooth wood of the floor of the wardrobe, she felt something soft and powdery and extremely cold. This is very queer, she said, and went on a step or two further. Next moment, she found that what was rubbing against her face and hands was no longer soft fur but something hard and rough and even prickly. Why, it's just like branches of trees, exclaimed Lucy. And then she saw that there was a light ahead of her, not a few inches away where the back of the wardrobe ought to have been, but a long way off. Something cold and soft was falling on her. A moment later, she found that she was standing in the middle of a wood at nighttime with snow under her feet and snowflakes falling through the air. Lucy felt a little frightened, but she felt very inquisitive and excited as well. She looked back over her shoulder, and there, between the dark tree trunks, she could still see the open doorway of the wardrobe and even catch a glimpse of the empty room from which she had set out. She had, of course, left the door open, for she knew that it is a very silly thing to lock, shut oneself into a wardrobe. It seemed to be still daylight there. I can always get back if anything goes wrong, thought Lucy. She began to walk forward, crunch, crunch, over the snow and through the wood towards the other light. In about ten minutes, she reached it and found that it was a lamp post. As she stood looking at it, wondering why there was a lamp post in the middle of a wood, and wondering what to do next, she heard a pitter-patter of feet coming towards her, and soon after that a very strange person stepped out from among the trees into the light of the lamp post. He was only a little taller than Lucy herself, and he carried over his head an umbrella, white with snow. From the waist upwards he looked like a man, but his legs were shaped like a goat's. The hair on them was glossy black, and instead of feet he had goat's hoofs. 
He also had a tail, but Lucy did not notice this at first, because it was neatly caught up over the arm that held the umbrella so as to keep it from trailing in the snow. He had a red woolen muffler around his neck, and his skin was rather reddish, too. He had a strange but pleasant little face, with a short pointed beard and curly hair, and out of the hair he, there stuck two horns, one on each side of his forehead. One of his hands, as I have said, held the umbrella. In the other arm he carried several brown paper parcels. What with the parcels and the snow, it looked just as if he had been doing his Christmas shopping. He was a fawn. And when Lu he saw Lucy, he gave such a start of surprise that he dropped all his parcels. Goodness gracious me, exclaimed the fawn. And that is the end of chapter one. Chapter two, what Lucy found there. Good evening, said Lucy. But the fawn was so busy picking up its parcels that at first it did not reply. When it had finished, it made her a little bow. Good evening, good evening, said the fawn. Excuse me, I don't want to be inquisitive, but I should, be, should I be right in thinking that you are a daughter of Eve? My, name, my name's Lucy, she said, not quite understanding him. But you are, forgive me, you are what they call a girl, said the fawn. Of course I'm a girl, said Lucy. You are, in fact, human? Of course I'm human, said Lucy, still a little puzzled. To be sure, to be sure, said the fawn. How stupid of me. But I've never seen a son of Adam or a daughter of Eve ex before. I am delighted. That is to say, and then it stopped as if it had been going to say something it had not intended, but remembered in time. Delighted, delighted, it went on. Allow me to introduce myself. My name is Tumnus. I am very pleased to meet you, Mr. Tumnus, said Lucy. And may I ask, O oh Lucy, daughter of Eve, said Mr. Tumnus, how you have come into Narnia? Narnia? What's that? said Lucy. This is the land of Narnia, said the fawn, where we are now, all that lies between the lamp post and the great castle of Caraparavel on the eastern sea. And you, you have come from the wild woods of the west? I, I got through the wardrobe in the spare room, said Lucy. Ah, said Mr. Tumnus in a rather melancholy voice. If only I had worked harder at geography when I was a little fawn, I should no doubt know all about those strange countries. It's too late now. But they aren't countries at all, said Lucy, almost laughing. It's just back there, at least. I'm not sure. It's summer there. Meanwhile, said Mr. Tumnus, it is winter in Narnia, and has been for ever so long. And we shall both catch cold if we stand here talking in the snow. Daughter of Eve from the land, of the far land of Spare Oom, where eternal summer reigns round the bright city of Wardrobe. How would it be if you came and had tea with me? Thank you very much, Mr. Tumnus, said Lucy. But I was wondering whether I ought to be getting back. It's only just around the corner, said the fawn, and there'll be a roaring fire, and toast, and sardines, and cake. Well, it's very kind of you, said Lucy, but I shan't be able to stay long. If you will take my arm, daughter of Eve, said Mr. Tumnus, I shall be able to hold the umbrella over both of us. That's the way. Now, off we go. And so Lucy found herself walking through the wood, arm in arm, with this strange creature as if they had known one another all their lives. They had not gone far before they came to a place where the ground became rough, and there were rocks all about, and little hills up and little hills down. At the bottom of one small valley, Mr. Tumnus turned suddenly aside, as if he were going to walk straight into an unusually large rock. But at the last moment, Lucy found he was leading her into the entrance of a cave. As soon as they were inside, she found herself blinking in the light of a wood fire. Then Mr. Tumnus stooped and took a flaming piece of wood out of the fire with a neat little pair of tongs and lit the lamp. Now, we shan't be long, he said, 
and immediately put a kettle on. Lucy thought she had never been in a nicer place. It was a little dry, clean cave of reddish stone with a carpet on the floor and two little chairs, one for me and one for a friend, said Mr. Tumnus, and a table and a dresser and a mantelpiece over the fire, and above that a picture of an old fawn with a gray beard. In one corner there was a door which Lucy thought must lead to Mr. Tumnus's bedroom, and on one wall was a shelf full of books. Lucy looked at these while he was setting out the tea things. They had titles like The Life and Letters of Silenus, or Nymphs and Their Ways, or Men, Monks, and Gamekeepers, A Study in Popular Legend, or Is Man a Myth? Now, daughter of Eve, said the fawn, and really it was a wonderful tea. There was a nice brown egg, lightly boiled for each of them, and then sardines on toast, and then buttered toast, and then toast with honey, and then a sugar-topped cake. And when Lucy was tired of eating, the fawn began to talk. He had wonderful tales to tell of life in the forest. He told about the midnight dances, and how the nymphs who lived in the wells and the dryads who lived in the trees came out to dance with the fawns about long hunting parties after the milk-white stag who could give you wishes if you caught him, about feasting and treasure-seeking with the wild red dwarfs in deep mines and caverns far beneath the forest floor, and then about summer when the woods were green and old Silenus on his fat donkey would come to visit them, and sometimes Bacchus himself and then the streams would run with wine instead of water, and the whole forest would give itself up to jollification for weeks on end. Not that it isn't always winter now, he added gloomily. Then, to cheer himself up, he took out from its case on the dresser a strange little flute that looked as if it were made of straw, and began to play. And the tune he played made Lucy want to cry and laugh and dance and go to sleep all at the same time. It must have been hours later when she shook herself and said, Oh, Mr. Tumnus, I'm so sorry to stop you, and I do love that tune, but really, I must go home. I only meant to stay for a few minutes. It's no good now, you know said the fawn, laying down its flute and shaking its head at her very sorrowfully. No good, said Lucy, jumping up and feeling rather frightened. What do you mean? I've got to go home at once. The others will be wondering what has happened to me. But a moment later she asked, Mr. Tumnus, whatever is the matter? For the fawn's brown eyes had filled with tears, and then the tears began trickling down its cheeks, and soon they were running off the end of its nose, and at last it covered its face with its hands and began to howl. Mr. Tumnus, Mr. Tumnus, said Lucy in great distress, don't, don't. What's the matter? Aren't you well? Dear Mr. Tumnus, do tell me what's wrong. But the fawn continued sobbing as if his heart would break, and even when Lucy went over and put her arms around him and lent him her handkerchief, he did not stop. He merely took the handkerchief and kept on using it, wringing it out with both hands whenever it got too wet to be of any more use, so that pr presently Lucy was standing in a damp patch. Mr. Tumnus! bawled Lucy in his ear, shaking him. Do stop! Stop it at once! You ought to be ashamed of yourself, a great big fawn like you. What on earth are you crying about? Oh, 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 sobbed Mr. Tumnus. I'm crying because I'm such a bad fawn. I don't think you're a bad fawn at all, said Lucy. I think you are a very good fawn. You are the nicest fawn I've ever met. Oh, oh, you wouldn't say that if you knew, replied Mr. Tumnus between his sobs. No, I'm a bad fawn. I don't suppose there ever were a worse fawn since the beginning of the world. But what have you done? asked Lucy. My old father now, said Mr. Tumnus. That's his picture over the mantelpiece. He would never have done a thing like this. A thing like what? said Lucy. Like what I've done, 
said the fawn, taken service under the white witch. That's what I am. I'm in the pay of the white witch. The white witch? Who, who is she? Why, it is she who has got all Narnia under her thumb. It's, it's she who makes it always winter. Always winter and never Christmas. Think of that. How awful, said Lucy. But what does she pay you for? That's the worst of it, said Mr. Tumnus with a deep groan. I'm a kidnapper for her, that's what I am. Look at me, daughter of Eve. Would you believe that I'm the sort of fawn to meet a poor innocent child in the wood, one that had never done me any harm, and pretend to be friendly with it, and invite it home to my cave, all for the sake of lulling it asleep and then handing it over to the white witch? No, said Lucy. I'm sure you wouldn't do anything of the sort. But I have, said the fawn. Well said Lucy rather slowly, for she wanted to be truthful and yet not be too hard on him. Well, that was pretty bad. But you're so sorry for it that I'm sure you will never do it again. Daughter of Eve, don't you understand? said the fawn. It isn't something I have done. I'm doing it now, this very moment. What do you mean? cried Lucy, turning very white. You are the child, said Thomas. I had orders from the white witch that if ever I saw a son of Adam or daughter of Eve in the wood, I was to catch them and hand them over to her, and you are the first I have ever met. And I've pretended to be your friend and asked you to tea, and all the time I've been meaning to wait till you were asleep and then go tell her. Oh, but you won't, Mr. Tumnus, said Lucy. You won't, will you? Indeed, indeed, you really mustn't. And if I don't, he said, beginning to, beginning to cry again, she's sure to find out, and she'll have my tail cut off, and my horns sawn off, and my beard plucked out, and she'll wave her wand over my beautiful cloven hooves and turn them into horrid solid hoofs like a wretched horse's, and if she's extra and specially angry, she'll turn me into stone, and I shall be only a statue of a fawn in her horrible house until the four thrones at Camp Paravel are filled, and goodness knows when that will happen happen, or whether it will ever happen at all. I'm very sorry, Mr. Tumnus, said Lucy, but please let me go home. Of course I will, said the fawn. Of course I've got to. I see that now. I hadn't known what humans were like before I met you. Of course I can't give you up to the witch, not now that I know you. But me, what? we must be off by once, at once. I'll see you back at the lamp post. I suppose you can find your own way from there back to spare oom and wardrobe. I'm sure I can, said Lucy. We must go as quietly as we can, said Mr. Tumnus. The whole wood is full of her spies. Even some of the trees are on her side. They both got up and left the tea things on the table. And Mr. Tumnus once more put up his umbrella and gave Lucy his arm, and they went out into the snow the journey back was not at all like the journey to the fawn's cave. They stole along as quickly as they could, without speaking a word, and Mr. Tumnus kept to the darkest places. Lucy was relieved when they reached the lamp post again. "'Do you know your way from here, daughter of Eve?' said Mr. Tumnus. Lucy looked very hard between the trees and could just see in the distance a patch of light that looked like daylight. Yes, she said, I can see the wardrobe door. Then be off as quickly as you can, said the fawn, and can you ever forgive me for what I meant to do? Why, of course I can, said Lucy, shaking him heartily by the hand, and I do hope you won't get into dreadful trouble on my account. Farewell, daughter of Eve, said he. Perhaps I may keep the handkerchief. Rather, said Lucy, and then ran towards the far-off patch of daylight as quickly as her legs would carry her. And presently, instead of, a rough, instead of rough branches brushing past her, she felt coats, and instead of crunching snow under her feet, she felt wooden boards, and all at once she found herself jumping out of the wardrobe into the same empty room from which the whole adventure had started. 
She su shut the wardrobe door tightly behind her and looked around, panting for breath. It was still raining, and she could hear the voices of the others in the passage. I'm here, she shouted. I'm here. I've come back. I'm all right. And that is the end of chapter two. Chapter three, Edmund and the Wardrobe. Lucy ran out of the empty room into the passage and found the other three. It's all right, she repeated. I've come back. What on earth are you talking about, Lucy? asked Susan. Why, said Lucy in amazement, haven't you all been wondering where I was? So you've been hiding, have you? said Peter. Poor old Lou, hiding and nobody noticed. You'll have to hide longer than that if you want people to start looking for you. But I've been away for hours and hours, said Lucy. The others all stared at one another. Batty, said Edmund, tapping his head. Quite batty. What do you mean, Lou? asked Peter. What I said, answered Lucy. It was just after breakfast when I went into the wardrobe, and I've been away for hours and hours and had tea and all sorts of things have happened. Don't be silly, Lucy, said Susan. We've only just come out of that room a moment ago, and you were there then. She's not being silly at all, said Peter. She's just making up a story for fun, aren't you, Lou? And why shouldn't she? No, Peter, I'm not, she said. It's... It's a magic wardrobe. There's a wood inside, and it's snowing, and there's a fawn and a witch, and it's called Narnia. Come and see. The others did not know what to think, but Lucy was so excited that they all went back with her into the room. She rushed ahead of them, flung open the door of the wardrobe, and cried, Now, go in and see for yourselves. Why, you goose? said Susan, putting her head inside and pulling the fur coats apart. It's just an ordinary wardrobe. Look, there's the back of it. Then everyone looked in and pulled the coats apart, and they all saw, Lucy herself saw, a perfectly ordinary wardrobe. There was no wood and no snow, only the back of the wardrobe with hooks on it. Peter went in and wrapped his knuckles on it to make sure that it was solid, a jolly good hoax, Lou, he said as he came out again. You have really taken us in, I must admit. We half believed you. But it wasn't a hoax at all, said Lucy. Really and truly, it was all different a moment ago. Honestly, it was, I promise. Come, Lou, said Peter. That's going a bit far. You've had your joke, and you better drop it now. Lucy grew very red in the face and tried to say something, though she hardly knew what she was trying to say, and burst into tears. For the next few days, she was very miserable. She could have made it up with the others quite easily at any moment if she could have brought herself to say that the whole thing was only a story made up for fun. But Lucy was a very truthful girl, and she knew that she was really in the right and she could not bring herself to say this. The others who thought she was telling a lie, and a silly lie, too, made her very unhappy. The two elder ones did this without meaning to do it, but Edmund could be spiteful, and on this occasion he was spiteful. He sneered and jeered at Lucy, and kept on asking her if she'd found any other new countries in other cupboards all over the house. What made it worse was that these days ought to have been delightful. The weather was fine, and they were out of doors from morning to night, bathing, fishing, climbing trees, and lying in the heather. But Lucy could not properly enjoy any of it. And so things went on until the next wet day. That day, when it came to the afternoon, and there was still no sign of a break in the weather, they decided to play hide-and-seek. Susan was it. And as soon as the others scattered to hide, Lucy went to the room where the wardrobe was. She did not mean to hide in the wardrobe, because she knew that would only set the others talking again about the whole wretched business. But she did want to have one more look inside it, for by this time she was beginning to wonder herself whether Narnia and the fawn had not been a dream. The house was so large and complicated and full of hiding places that she thought she would have time to have one look into the wardrobe and then hide somewhere else. 
But as soon as she reached it, she heard steps in the passage outside, and then there was nothing for it but to jump into the wardrobe and hold the door closed behind her. She did not shut it properly because she knew that it is very silly to shut oneself into a wardrobe, even if it is not a magic one. Now, the steps she had heard were those of Edmund, and he came into the room just in time to see Lucy le vanishing into the wardrobe. He at once decided to get into it himself, not because he thought it a particularly good place to hide, but because he wanted to go on teasing her about her imaginary country. He opened the door. There were the coats hanging up as usual, and a smell of mothballs, and darkness and silence, and no sign of Lucy. She thinks I'm Susan, come to catch her, said Edmund to himself, and so she's keeping very quiet at the back. He jumped in and shut the door, forgetting what a very foolish thing it is to do. Then he began feeling about for Lucy in the dark. He had expected to find her in a few seconds, and was very surprised when he did not. He decided to open the door again and let in some light, but he could not find the door either. He didn't like this at all, and began groping wildly in every direction. He even out shouted out, Lucy, Lou, where are you? I know you're here. There was no answer, and Edmund noticed that his own voice had a curious sound. Not the sound you expect in a cupboard, but a kind of open air sound. He also noticed that he was unexpectedly cold, and then he saw a light. Thank goodness, said Edmund. The door must have swung open of its own accord. He forgot all about Lucy and went towards the light, which he thought was the open door of the wardrobe. But instead of finding himself stepping out into the spare room, he found himself stepping out from the shadows of some thick, dark fir trees into an open place in the middle of a wood. There was crisp, dry snow under his feet, and more snow lying on the branches of the trees. Overhead, there was a pale blue sky, the sort of sky one sees on a fine winter day in the morning. Straight ahead of him, he saw between the tree trunks the sun, just rising very red and clear. Everything was perfectly still, as if he were the only living creature in that country. There was not even a robin or a squirrel among the trees, and the wood stretched as far as he could see in every direction. He shivered. He now remembered that he had been looking for Lucy, and also how unpleasant he had been to her about, the, about her imaginary country, which now turned out not to have been imaginary at all. He thought that she must be somewhere quite, quite close, and so he shouted, Lucy! Lucy, I'm here to... Edmund! There was no answer. She was angry about all the things I've been saying lately, thought Edmund, and though he did not like to admit that he had been wrong, he also did not much like being alone in this strange, cold, quiet place, so he shouted again, I say, Lou, I'm sorry, I didn't believe you. I see now you were right all along. Do come out, make it pax. Still, there was no answer. Just like a girl, said Edmund to himself, sulking somewhere and won't accept an apology. He looked round him again and decided he did not much like this place, and had almost made up his mind to go home when he heard, very far off in the wood, a sound of bells. He listened, and the sound came nearer and nearer, and at last there swept into sight a sledge drawn by two reindeers. The reindeer were about the size of, a Sh of Shetland ponies, and their hair was so white that even the snow hardly looked white compared with them. Their branching horns were gilded and shone like something on fire when the sunrise caught them. Their harness was of scarlet le leather and covered with bells. On the sledge, driving the reindeer, sat a fat dwarf, who would have been about three feet high if he had been standing. He was dressed in polar bear's fur, and on his head he wore a red hood with a long gold tassel hanging down from its point. His huge beard covered his knees and served him instead of a rug. 
but behind him, on a much higher seat in the middle of the sledge, sat a very different person, a great lady, taller than any woman that Edmund had ever seen. She also was covered in white fur up to her throat and held a long, straight golden wand in her right hand and wore a golden crown on her head. Her face was white, not merely pale, but white like snow, or paper, or icing sugar, except for her very red mouth. It was a beautiful face in other respects, but proud and cold and stern. The sledge was a fine sight as it came sweeping towards Edmund with the bells jingling and the dwarf cracking his whip and the snow flying up on each side of it. Stop, said the lady and the dwarf pulled the reindeer up so sharply that they almost sat down. Then they recovered themselves and stood champing their bits and blowing. In the frosty air, the breath coming out of their nostrils looked like smoke. "'And what, pray, are you?' said the lady, looking hard at Edmund. "'I'm... I'm... My name's Edmund,' said Edmund, rather awkwardly. He did not like the way she looked at him. The lady frowned. Is that how you address a queen? She asked, looking sterner than ever. I beg your pardon, your majesty. I didn't know, said Edmund. Not know the queen of Narnia, cried she. Ha! Huh, you shall know us better hereafter. But I repeat, what are you? Please, your majesty, said Edmund. I don't know what you mean. I'm at school, at least I was. It's the holidays now. And that is the end of the chapter.